Now let's talk for a few minutes about the mouth. Hmm. How many of you would love to do that? Proverbs 18, 20, 21. I may not be telling you anything that you don't know, but it doesn't mean you don't need to hear it again. I study scriptures on the mouth all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. A man's moral self shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth. And with the consequences of his words, he must be satisfied whether good or evil. Isn't that amazing? So our words have consequences. Words are containers for power. Just like this glass up here contains my water, and this little Kleenex thing contains my Kleenex, our words contain something. And they contain power. But it can be positive power that will help us, or help other people, or it can be negative power that will hurt us, or hurt other people. The next verse says, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Wow. Think about that. Every time I open my mouth, I'm either ministering life or I'm ministering death, not only to other people, but to myself. And those who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for death or life. This is where we get the phrase, you're gonna eat those words. So many of the cutesy little things that we say came straight out of Scripture. You're going to eat those words. And the truth is, is we do. Because our words come out of our mouth, they go right around here, fall back in our ears, fall right back down in our spirit. And that's what we have to feed on. We feel yucky if we talk bad about people. We have a heaviness if we gossip and judge and criticize. You sit at lunch and complain about your job and complain about your boss and complain about other coworkers, you are just asking for a miserable day. <laughs> Let's just say that you've prayed for your husband to be saved and you prayed for your children to be saved. Now you go to lunch with your friends and your friend says, so how's your husband doing? How are your kids doing? Oh, I tell you, I just don't know if they're ever going to change. <laughs> I am just so sick and tired of the way they act. I tell you, it's just more than any living human being should be expected to endure. <laughs> I mean, you just really don't know how hard I've got it. It is really bad. Well, don't waste your time praying. We pray, and then we negate our own prayers with words that kill the power of the prayer that we prayed. If we're gonna pray, then we have to talk in agreement with the prayer that we prayed. That one thing was worth you coming, amen? I have to be careful of the same thing. We all need to pray on a regular basis that God would help us to really realize how powerful words are. And you know what? I still don't think that I totally get it after all the study I've done because it's obvious if we really understood that the power of life and death was in the tongue that we would be a lot more careful about what we say, wouldn't we? I mean, if we really, 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 really believed that scripture, we would be a lot more careful about what we say. I said today, no evil thing can dwell in my body. Sickness and disease cannot survive in me because I am full of light and full of the power of God. I was just driving over here and just kind of muttered that under my breath. Use your quiet time to say something that makes sense. Don't just sit on a stool somewhere and worry. Moods. Hmm. Moods. Dave said he used to drive down the highway coming home from work and think, I wonder what she'll be like tonight. <laughs> it is just really unpleasant to live with somebody who's just up and down and all over the board. The thing that I have appreciated more than anything about my husband is his stability. 
And I desperately needed that example in my life because I never had any stability growing up. I lived in a wild house. And I honestly believe that one of the greatest ways that we can show people our faith in God is by learning how to remain stable in every kind of situation. We cannot control when emotions will or won't show up, but we can learn to not let them control us. And I wrote out here in my notes, this is the best I can offer you. <laughs> I can't give you a plan to tell you that you're always going to feel the way you'd like to feel. And if I tried to, I'd be lying. Emotions come and go. They roar in and they subside. They're there when you don't want them, not there when you do want them. You can get angry just like that. Something happens you weren't expecting. <clears throat> but the Bible says, when you're angry, do not sin. It's not a sin to feel anger. It's a sin to let the anger control you. <laughs> well, I can't help how I feel, Joyce. Well, I'll give you that. Unless you're fueling those feelings with your own thoughts and words, and sometimes we can't control what feelings come. I mean, you know, you, you go to bed some nights and you think you got all these plans for tomorrow and you just feel all full of zip and you know you're going to do it. And you wake up the next morning and feel like you can't even drag yourself out of bed. <laughs> you didn't plan that. That wasn't what you wanted. But you don't have to live according to that. It was so important to me to learn that although I couldn't control every feeling that I had, that I did not have to obey them and bow down to them. Let us stop worshiping our feelings and start worshiping God. So in the midst of all of this that God is teaching you, He very clearly calls you into ministry. Probably a bit of a surprise to you and maybe some of the people around you as well. <laughs> Well, I think we have to start by saying that in the midst of my desperation for some kind of peace and just really being tired of life as it was, because at that point, we'll say it was like about 1976, and I was, uh, I did love God, and we went to church on a regular basis, and I know that I was saved. I would have gone to heaven had I died, because I really understood salvation by grace. But I tell you, I didn't have any victory in my life, not in any not in any area. You know, I didn't know how to think. I didn't, I didn't talk right in any area. You know, I was basically just defeating myself with my own, you know, negative talk all the time. And I was just moody and, and irrational. And of course, you know, I was always picking fights with Dave. And one morning I was on my way to work and I just cried out to God in desperation. God, you've got to do something. I cannot go on like this anymore. And who knows why God picks any certain day. Maybe that I'm sure that wasn't the first time I'd ever said that, but but God really touched me that day. And, you know, I won't try to explain that other than to just say that I knew that God had, had touched me. I really felt his presence and, and, uh, and God just, he filled me with his spirit and just gave me a, a love for the word and a, a hope that things could be different. Mm. And so out of that love for the word, I began to study. And very shortly, right in, I mean, just very in the early beginnings of my really starting to study the Word and care about the Word, God made me very aware, called me into ministry and let me know that He wanted me to teach His Word. Well, I mean, I promptly responded back, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that's a big, long story. I mean, it would take way too long, but let's just suffice to say that I answered the call on my life and started a Bible study. And uh, it was just, just about 20, 25 people. And I always say, God, let me practice on them for about five years before I did anything more public. After that, I went to work at a church, started a, mm -hmm. a women's ministry there, was one of the pastors there, and, you know, then finally into what I'm doing now. But Step by I, step. Yeah, step by step. You don't just think you're going to be used by God to do something and the next day run off to the world. It was literally step by step. I studied so hard. I mean, I would study six, seven, eight hours to teach for maybe 
45 minutes. And it was all that studying that helped get the word in me. Mm -hmm. And I remember one woman saying one time, all you're really doing is letting us eat off your plate. <laughs> so really it was like God was feeding me and as he was feeding me and teaching me, then I was sharing what he was teaching me yeah. with other people. And you know, the Holy Spirit is so wonderful to lead us. You know, somebody might say, well, I've got 50 problems. Where do I start? And you really just start by how God is leading you. And although this is not a, a session on how to study the Bible, what I would do many times is just start to read somewhere and then I would just hit something that interested me. Mm -hmm. You know, you like, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Well, and then right away I would get, well, I'm, I go to bed mad pretty much every night. And so then I would just start to look up all the places in the Bible that it talked about anger. And then I'd begin to pray about that. And the Holy Spirit is just so beautiful to lead us and guide us. I mean, you talk about being a counselor. I mean, the Holy Spirit is a counselor par excellence. I mean, he knows exactly what we need, when, mm -hmm. how much, and he will lead us and guide us and bring that healing into our life. So no, I was not ministry material, <laughs> but once again, God used it in my life because it got me to study. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, God just uses all kinds of different things in our personality. He got me to study and I was very diligent. Oh, I worked so hard and I was so diligent. I probably worked too hard, almost killed myself in the beginning just from exhaustion of working so hard. But nonetheless, God used all of that and step by step, he got us to where we are today. Frustrations along the way? Oh. Not always God's time like or a jillion, you know, your yeah. timing may be a little different than his. I said I've probably cried a swimming pool full of tears, yeah. but at the end of it, you know, there's joy. Weeping endures for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And the thing that I say to people all the time is I think one of the key ingredients to success, possibly the number one key is just don't give up. Just don't give up. Just keep, keep on keeping on. Just keep on keeping on. And many times I would just put one foot in front of the other, didn't know how something was going to work out. How is this ever? And really what I'm doing today is really from where I started and where I came from is absolutely, totally, completely impossible if it wasn't God doing it through us. Well, you mentioned that one of those things that God did with that call was to give you hope. Mm -hmm. How important was holding on to that hope um, while you were going through this process of beginning the ministry? Well, it's really everything because hope deferred makes the heart sick. Yeah. When people have no hope, they easily become despondent and filled with despair. And the word despair means that you just see absolutely no way. There's just, you are without a way. And I love the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And really, he is our hope. Any time that Christ comes into your life, you do have hope unless you just have a very, very negative mindset and really just don't know anything at all about the Word. But if you begin to read the Word of God, the Bible teaches us to become prisoners of hope. And I love that analogy that we just need to be like locked up, so to speak, in a prison cell with hope. And as long as you will not stop hoping that things can change and that something good can happen to you, then you will see victory a long way. I want to talk to you today about always believing. Coming to Christ like a little child and just say, I believe. I trust you. I believe. I may not see it. I may not feel it. But I believe. I've been thinking about believing and, and about faith. And, you know, it, it, it's not something you do with your head. <laughs> Now our mind gets renewed, and I think now, and probably for many of you who've walked with God a long time, I do believe all this stuff in my mind too because my mind's been renewed, but there's still times when my mind can't get a hold of something. When I look at a situation, and even sometimes not just for me, but in other people, I'll look at their situation or look at that person and just, you know, I want to believe, but with what I'm looking at, it's like, uh -huh, uh -huh, I don't know. But thank God, we're more than just a mind and a body. We are first and foremost a spirit. And it's with our spirit man that we believe. I didn't see Jesus die, but I know that I know that I know, I know that he did. Why? 
See, a, a person who doesn't understand faith would say, well, how, how do you know that? Well, I just know because God has revealed it to me in the spirit, just like many of you. If you can get a hold of this today, I think it's gonna elevate you to a new place. We spend way too much time in our mind. And believe me, the devil offers us all kinds of thoughts that do not agree with the Word of God. We have to learn to believe what God says, and we grasp it by faith. We reach out and we grasp it with the Spirit. I want to live more in the Spirit. I want to walk more in the Spirit and not just walk in my feelings or my own mind or, you know, my own will, but in the Spirit. Is anybody with me today? We want to begin to walk in the Spirit. What is my Spirit saying about this situation? Is it really hopeless like my brain wants me to think it is? Or are all things possible with God? Does, does God still have a miracle for me? Does he love everybody equally? If he's ever done anything for anybody, surely he can do something for me. He's no respecter of persons. So believing, I think you can decide to, if you want to. Or you can keep making yourself miserable all the time, trying to figure things out in life. Some of you know that about 23 years ago, I had breast cancer. Wasn't expecting to go to the doctor and get that report. I just went for my little checkup thing and had a mammogram, got a call back. There's something on here that doesn't look good. It's small, but we really feel like you should get it checked out. So got the biopsy thinking that was just all gonna come back fine. Well, it didn't come back fine. Came back and said, although this is a very small tumor, it is, it is a very fast-growing type of cancer. And so back then, they really just recommended a, a mastectomy. They didn't, they didn't do the other things that they do today. And so here, within like a week's period of time, I went from a woman of faith and power preaching the gospel all over the place to seemingly being in a position where none of what I was preaching was working for me. But God spoke some things to my heart very early in that little journey because, you know, when you hear things like that, fear just <laughs> hits you. And there were some things that God told me to say and some things that He did not want to hear me say. Don't ask me why. I want to hear you say, God loves me, I trust Him, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. There were five things like that, all really positive things, and I walked around for the seven or ten days before the surgery saying those things over and over and over. And when doubt and unbelief would hit my mind, I would say, I trust God. I trust God. God's going to take care of this. He loves me. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. They tell me that when I woke up from the anesthesia that I was saying all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. But about three years ago, I went for my regular checkup. Well, no, that, that's not what happened. I was, I was having some back problems. And so they did a MRI on my back and the report came back. There's some spots on your spine that we're concerned about. They knew I'd had cancer, you gotta tell them that. So they looked at it and I had to have some more tests and then I had to have a whole bone scan and. You know, they said, we're very concerned that the breast cancer you had is metastasized to your spine. And so, you know, you got these two weeks in between, you know, where you're waiting to get the test, waiting to get the test back. And you know what? I can honestly tell you that I just really wasn't all that afraid because I just thought, now I didn't want, it, want them to tell me that I had cancer, but I just thought, God, I'm in your hands. 
I'm going to live till you're done with me. I've had a good ride, and I believe that you can take care of this, and I refuse to start getting this negative attitude and living in fear. Well, when it came back, they did a bone scan on my whole entire body, so I'm here to tell you there's nothing in there that's bothering anybody. I mean, I got it all. And this is what they said. Well, there's no cancer. I said, okay, so what are the spots on my spine? And they said, well, it actually looks like a cancer had metastasized to your bone and it healed itself. I thought, no, it didn't heal itself. So I wanted to share that because there may be people here today that you've had a bad report from the doctor. You just, maybe people, I mean, there may be people laying in the hospital right now watching this program and you're like, there's no hope for me. I'm so scared. This is not, not going to work. I'm going to die. Instead of saying all that, just say, God, I trust you. I trust you. And you know what? If you're watching from home and you've not received Christ as your Savior, please call the number on your screen and let one of my workers pray with you and lead you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You do not have to be alone with your situation. God loves you. He cares about you. And He's got a good plan for your life. Just believe. Can I tell you something? Believing doesn't cost anything. Unbelief makes you miserable. Believing makes you happy. Can I encourage you not to look at one day in your life or one month in your life or even one year in your life and start determining all these things about God from that one year? Look at your life as a whole. You know, if I wanted to just stare at the first 18 years of my life, I'd probably want to go hang myself. And then to tell you the truth, the next five weren't all that great either because I married a guy just to get away from the situation I was in. I thought nobody would ever want me and he was goofier than I was. And so, you know, that was just another five-year nightmare. So by the time I was 23, I could never remember ever having been happy. Never. I could not ever remember ever having been happy. Never. So I didn't have a great start. And if I just looked at those years... I'd be in a really bad mood right now. But I got to look at all the rest of it too. I got to look at what God's doing now and, and how He's using that and how that fit into my life. Amen? You know, there may be some terrible things that have happened to you, but God's still got some other ingredients to add into your life. He's still got some other stuff to throw into that life happening thing that's going to make it turn out pretty good. But you see, here's the thing. The Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. John 16, 24, ask and receive that your joy may be full. John 15, 11, Jesus said, I've told you all these things that my joy might be made full and complete in you, that my enjoyment might fill your soul. I don't know how happy Jesus was, but he tells me, however happy he was, I can have that, and I want it. I'll have to say that I really enjoy my life now. I wasted a lot of years, and about 15, 20 years ago, I started getting a hold of this revelation, and I had to do some work because it was harder for me than just saying, well, I'm going to start enjoying my life. I, you know, there were a lot of components to why I wasn't enjoying my life. I didn't know anything about being childlike. I was way too overly responsible. I had a false sense of responsibility, and I made myself responsible for things that only God could do something about. And if I wasn't working on my problem, I was happy to work on yours. <laughs> I didn't even need to know you to help you with your problem. And not only that, I felt responsible to fix your problem. <laughs> and it was killing me. 
And some of you are that way too. And you walk around, God, I can't stand this. What's wrong with my life? I don't have any peace. I don't have any joy. Believe. Let's learn how to laugh at ourselves. Let's take every opportunity that we can possibly find to laugh. Anything that's funny, get into it full force. I mean, laugh, 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 because laughter is good for us. Joy and peace are found in believing. Believe God and upgrade your joy. Amen? Come on, let's all stand up. Well, the past few days, I've shared with you some of the greatest lessons that I've learned through the years. Because I do believe that these principles can help us to heal. I want you to have them so you can listen to them over and over and over. We don't have to live in our past pain. We can develop a close, intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father, know who we are in Christ, and live the best life that we can possibly live. This handsome little guy's name is David, and he's 12 days old. He was born two months early, and he weighs 1.6 kilos. You know, if it wasn't for this wonderful home here in Kampala, Uganda, that cares for orphan and abandoned children, he would not have made it. But because of the work that the people here are doing, and we're in partnership with them, many children are having an opportunity for a brand new life. So we just want to thank you for being involved. I think it's a great work. God bless you. See you